to inspiration economy. And this is a new concept that Dr. Mohamed Mohajim found, founded this concept with me working with him. Uh, it's a concept we thought that around the world we've been seeing through lots of different economies, from uh, communism to capitalism, knowledge economy. And then we think that we would like to talk about something that we call and we name it inspiration economy. Uh, this is a concept that we tried to bring, we tried to register it in, uh, we started it in the European Union. Uh, we are not only academics, we are practitioners, we try to apply this concept in different countries around the world, with different groups and NGOs and universities, so that I'm going to speak a lot about today. And in academically, we do have two academic journals that I would like to call everyone to publish with us, I'm going to introduce later on, that we try to mix between academic life and what we call it in reality, the practitioners to be closer to people. Today I'm going to talk about social economy, and I thought, as you said, a woman uh, award, I will focus about the women programs that we work uh, in around the world. So we talk about a lot about the inspiration economy and resilience economy, and especially when I'm in a country like India, I cannot go passing without talking about resilience because I think it's one of the best countries in the world that is the real model of such concepts and how we can use our interesting power to change the world. So what is a real woman empowerment and inspiration economy? I know lots of the speeches today morning and this is a stage talk about human empowerment that we always talk about, but when we talk about it, we talk about the capacity of women. So we study the relation between the power that women have and how they can change the socio-economy activity. We always think that women, they work more only in social things, but they are fit in the uh, economy and the social behavior that they can utilize. This is something that we need to focus on more. So uh, how women, they influence a lot of decision-making the process, participating in their social, economic, technical, political activities, and creating effective uh, learning that women can make. I'm going to make this a little bit easier. I'll talk about some of case study and examples that we talked about in our uh, inspiration labs. We think that there are three stages of empowering women. There are in the one that's empowering for being independent, that we work how to be more independent about the concept. And the level two, women who work for development, not only their development, but even the development of their society. And so the, uh, empowering for advancement. And here also, I'm not talking about women who work on their advancement, but women who work on the advancement of their societies and community. And there is a story for everyone that I'm going to talk about. So uh, I'm talking the case one about the case study we have in uh, Mauritania. And the second one is about a project that we worked when, when we were in Bosnia. And I ended up with a concept that I worked in in Bahrain, my country. And how when we work with women empowerment they, and we work in ability, effectiveness, and efficiency, how we can change the way we work in these uh, projects. So here are the case studies. Now, this is the first case of study. It's about a Mauritanian woman. Uh, we visited the village there in uh, Mauritania, where Dr. Mohamed Bukhaji now, as I'm speaking, he's there in the desert, trying to work there with them to continue the project. They are very famous on camels. I know you do have also camels in India, but they are, as a desert, they are more famous than camels. They have one of the best camel wools of the, in the world. And they use to have a factory uh, that was not really well utilized. And uh, this factory used to have old machine and women, the way they used to work in it, with the capitalism thinking, women leave their villages, leave their homes, they need to come all to this uh, factory to work there all over the week to produce uh, the carpet. And when they produce the carpet, it's not really very valuable when they sell it because it's like any machine carpet. It's not organic carpet, which should be more valuable anymore. And what has happened that when we arrived this village, they got a fund from one of the rich uh, countries, the trolling country in the Arab region, it's trying to fund them and to produce them a more a new, uh, newer machine so they can produce more carpets. 
But then when we studied this, economically, they thought that this was going to be more effectiveness, they can produce more carpet. When we go and went into studying it about it from social economy concept, we find so, uh, in social perspective, it's not helping them. It's letting women being far from their family all around the week, uh, and to be separated economically, it's not going to have a high-end market when they want to sell it to their cross-border, which is Europe because it's going to be like any machine carpet, and they cannot compete the big companies and factories in the world, like China, for example, who can produce much more. So even the economic value was reduced. Here, where we try and we say, we will not take, as we citizen thinking, we, are not going, we will not have the funds of millions. We are only going to fund each village or each machine with 100 US dollar where they go back to the uh, original hand machine that they can do the wool and they start, and in each house it should be like five women from the village camp and work and to produce a handmade organic carpet from this camel that is one of the different from all parts of the world and they produce it. So here we try to bring up the social life, they are their families, the families who were refusing women to go on to work in factories were there the second thing, it had more, it had more uh, value because it was uh, now organic. And then we say for the women NGOs who are trying to do the women empowerment, looking for funds, we told them instead of focusing on how to bring more funds, you should stay to work to just market their things in a real way. With this, and on each carpet, there was a story of the village, of the woman, how they appraise things. So here where we think that sometimes, not always with funds, you will change uh, the thing. And this is like the, uh, the first thing that we try to say that when we try only to empower women like in level one. And so the story I was say, talking about was how they was used to be before what we call it Inspiration Economy Lab. And how after that we try to make it more available, more special, and with the story there in a different way. So uh, here where we think that women development can go for a better high-end uh, level. If I talk about the uh, level two, that's women development, I'm going to talk about uh, women NGO that we worked in for a couple of years in Bosnia, where we both stayed there for around six months working with them. So this was a very powerful NGO that it has lots of branches around Bosnia. They are, uh, they are linked to international NGOs. They try to work very hard in empowering women uh, in this area. We work in Bihaj, it's an area north of uh, Bosnia, which is a borderline of all Europe. We notice, although they do program, how they count the women empowerment, how they, how they measure their things. They measure only the results they get off their program. So they measure how many workshop they have done, how many women attended their workshop, how many training was there, how many trainees was, uh, was attending there. So they never tried to count the impact of the things that they were getting. And because they are driven of as an NGO to get funds from uh, the European Union, from international organization, just to run out this workshop, what happened that they had always to get busy on writing this form and working on them. And sometimes even they get to get far from their target about empowering, not only empowering women, but empowering women to, towards advancement of their society. For example, I'm, I always give one of the examples that uh, one of the most things that they did always fight for was to, from the uh, German embassy about teaching German language. So where they thought, oh, we are giving women more skills, they are attending our workshops and coming. But this was the result with a lot of women attending there that they have a very high population of immigrants there. Every year there, like every two classes of uh, children closes because mother and families uh, migrated from uh, Bosnia and go and work in Germany and other countries of the, of the European Union. And these are all people who are in their middle age, who are, are, should be ready to contribute to their community, to their society. At that age, they learn another language, so it's fine that the NGOs, instead of working for empowering women to empower their country, 
they use to work in the farming movement and skills that help them to migrate and leave their country and leave their country. You can see only now when after they retire, they come back or in their childhood. So here's something how we just change the concept of not only the number of training we are giving and the labs we are giving or the workshop, what is the impact of how we change the concept of measuring our things, evaluating our things, in the way that's going to change our community and society. Our goal and result is not only empowering women for women, it's empowering women because women are added value to their community and society, and this is how we need to work on this. So here, where we try to, this at self assessment of the program, we try to change this way of thinking. Uh, and uh, so here's where we take it to a second level. Uh, my third story is about Bahraini women advancement, where we tried also at the beginning uh, as a petroleum country, we thought that having more resources, having everything available, thinking of more availability of uh, resources for women going to empowerment. Yes, I'm in a country that we don't have women at all, we do have health care of everyone, we do have lots of things. But then uh, there was also always women started to think that for me to give, I need to have something from government always to give me. I need to be empowered. If I'm not empowered, I'm not going to go from step one to step two. And here it was very difficult to change the mindset of how to change the measures of women and how we try to bring the measures that uh, if the woman will not contribute in the market, how the market's going to be done. It's not about uh, that the community are empowering women to go and come in. They are in need of women. So here we try to design the national model of women in a different way. Not in a way that women need to be empowered to go in the community, but what is the need of the community of the women and what they are going to miss if women miss being there. And we are missing a lot because the, uh, the other way of thinking. So here we try to think in reversible way and what we need from the other thing, rather than only measuring the empowering women, here we can really make a world class success stories of women. And I wish in a few years time when we get this award of women, it's not about what we've done for us as a woman, for me individually, but how did I change the community and society, how did I contribute to my GDP, that's going to be something that we need to count and uh, measure more. Uh, I'm going in the slides very fast, so you know, let's just to make it shorter as much as I can. So uh, how can we protect women empowerment in an innovative way? So we need to look more at successful stories in a different way. How we put our stories, how we bring them up, how we uh, measure them. Uh, doing this part of the presentation was very difficult for me. I thought, as I'm in India, let's we'll talk a little bit about India, but it's going to be very difficult because I know you are all more experts than me in the field, and that's just how I view it as an academic external. So this is the age structure and population of uh, India. When I see this pyramid of India population, I can see that uh, a lot are in the childhood here and elderly. And mostly, the, the upper part and lower part, they always depend on, on women more and more. So here, where a woman gets a drain, because she has to take care of the people below and the people up, we're getting more uh, elderly people. And here, where we need to have more, when we talk about empowering women, it's not empowering women, it needs to be empowering the society to accept the community and to share responsibility their women are going to be empowered. It's not about, I empower you to do this, to be better in your work, be better in your home, but all of this is on your, on your shoulder. You, we need to take care of things in a different way. So we need to have more dependent women, we need to look at the problems in a different way. So, and we need to look at the diversity of the problems in a uh, different way. How can we have uh, solutions and a different way and changing the mindsets. Uh, so even when we get uh, funds and sponsors of lots of things, so how we can about uh, housing services, we need to think of this in a different way. We always think about the services that are applied outside of the government, the services which we get. But we need to be more uh, innovative on these things. 
how we think that we need to make women more independent on that. Uh, women do have different uh, level of uh, knowledge and uh, capacities and network that they have. So how we can build <coughs> in all these things and how they can prioritize uh, their life. Uh, I think I will not go into this. Okay. I'll give now an example of uh, countries abroad. These are studies that made in Switzerland about the communities on, uh, in Europe. And they found how when an, uh, any board with this woman or this integrated, I'm not talking here about equal opportunities for women, when we have a mixed community, men, women, different ethnicities, different religions, even different generations, mixture of fields, they always the income, a financial income for the boards gets much higher than of the boards that have less women there that are less mixed uh, community in their work. So with high percentage of women leaders, they perform better financially. These were big companies like Credit Suisse, uh, Bank and other companies have approved this all over the years that we need also to address this and how here the more they had women, the more their financial, uh, their management, how their financial <coughs> went higher. It goes together. The more you have women, the more you will perform better. So, uh, and how when women cited boards, the less the gap you have, the less you are going to have loses in your life. And the uh, economic contribution of women, we can see India as the number 115 in the world. Although women are in a big population here, but still measuring their contribution to their economic society, it's not always because they are not contributing, but mostly because their contribution is not counted. There are two issues. We do have contributions, but we do also have that a lot of contribution of, or effort that they are doing in their households, in their communities, that are not counted in a real way how they are, they are contributing to their GDP. And that sometimes makes us all in a lower level comparing to countries that they measure even the uh, unpaid work that women do. Where in other Western countries, all, they don't have a real unpaid work because even the unpaid work are counted in their GDP. And here, why they are always like countries like Sweden or Germany are at the top of the list. And here, another example of how they progress toward GDP and how what is the contribution of women and the GDP also when we go and count our countries. I'm not saying that I'm in a better situation, Bahrain, but I'll not talk about the example of Bahrain. We are one of the smallest countries in the world. Maybe most of you, they, even you don't know where is it in the map, because they normally they just put a dot and they write our name anywhere in other countries because there's no place for us in, big, uh, in this big map with big countries like India. But even in a country like India with all the population of women, the, how they measure women contribution in GDP also need to be readdressed. So here I'm going back to talk about the models that we try uh, to work in and how the, from the problem we always find opportunities. The more the countries need more problems, that means more opportunities that can come from because it's like a case study. I always say that people in the medical field, they like when they have a sophisticated cases come to them because they can do uh, a better results, they can make more tests in it, and such. And the same thing for us who work in the uh, social field, we think that more communities with more sophisticated problems also, it's more chances to get solution and to try more new uh, things of uh, bringing. So, and here I brought the map and I was surprised, although this is not a very new map, uh, it's from the OC, but it's from a couple of years ago. The opportunity on the, uh, here, the literacy rate map, where it shows also a little bit high in uh, India still. <laughs> Although I can say that's one of the best universities now around the world, lots of people from my country, from all generations, from my mother's generation, they used to come and uh, teach and learn from India schoolers who are all around the world, but still the literacy map here is very high. And here when they work in the unpaid work, that, and that's why it's not counted in the GDP. It doesn't mean always only educated people should have contribution to the GDP. And I think here is the gap that's how this is 
counted. So uh, here where we talk about selective empowerment. So when we have the selective empowerment, we empower each community differently, we become selective in how we empower uh, the groups of women to empower their countries and their empowerment should be effective and counted. Here where we talk about how we measure and we put our index and inspiration uh, economy. So, and we also, one of the main things that we work in, and that's why we try to bring the stories that we work all around the world, that the most uh, important thing is that's influencing without power. The more you go to work with, and when we mean, when we mean power, the power of money, the power of position, the power of government. So what we do, we work with inspiration economy as a, uh, what we were trying to do, we try to do a prototype in small community and then these small changes are going to lead for big changes. We don't wait for those to change or for a government to change because it's always easy. In social problem we say if such laws going to change, then the community is going to change. And this is not reality. If we don't change the mindset of the people, we don't have a really case study that we can bring on the table really up, no one is going to adapt it and work in it. So here where we need to work more towards things. What make women more effective in socioeconomic ports? When we work in socioeconomic projects, we work in three elements. It should touch the heart, the physical, the spirit, and then, so here where the mind will alert. And women always, it's not only because our women are, we are really more ready to address these things. We touch these things more. We feel of the effectiveness of it more. But it doesn't mean that we work only with our feelings, but also when we work in measures and we work in mixed community, we can bring more such of uh, projects that work and uh, inspiring our society and uh, the resilience and how we can bring the uh, more, become more influential to the developments, not only growth. I mean, every country and every community that are all going to grow one day. All of us, we grow, but we are talking about more about development and not to grow. We don't want only to measure how we say in which year and what women help in growing uh, only the societies and societies are growing around the world. No, we are talking about the development <coughs> of these society. So I think there are now many opportunities for Indian women. They have a very fast growing nation, one of the fastest, and this is, some people will look at it as a problem, but it's really a rich opportunity that they can work in. They have lots of uh, youth there, lots of children there, and these are all things that they can build on it. They have a very high resilient society, and it's really an example that cannot be repeated all around the world. You can see it fights in most of the, around the world is going because of the absence of the resilience that they have here. And they have very influencing the originality. They influence any community they go in. Uh, I can tell you back home, we are influenced by Indian food, clothes, uh, lifestyle. You can name it. And this is not only in my country, you can feel it everywhere. So this is the power that they can really build on it and use it and where they can make social economy changes and effects. So this is the fast growing that you have in India that you can build on it and how your uh, social economy fast growing nation and affecting the, the community. I like to bring example from, uh, I don't know how you look, uh, I'm sure everyone is fan with Bollywood and their films and how now even your films and movies are changing towards more uh, social economy concepts uh, I don't know how many of you have seen the Padman uh, film, but it's really a good example of how socio-economy can be done by women and men together and how they can tackle these problems that have the both social and economic <coughs> prob uh, uh, problems can be solved in a different way when you think differently. And we need more of these things to change the mindset of people. It's not only about talking about such uh, an example of this. And uh, here also the gender pay gap of India, and we can see there is a big wage gap between men and women, because women here mostly also work in unpaid work, or sometimes even accept to work with a lower uh, income for same uh, jobs. So these are the measures that came by OECD, but 
uh, thanks God that the gap is getting reduced over the year, but I think also this is something that we need to work in, address, to close the gender pay gap around the world, and it's a big issue because we can see also the, uh, the unpaid work of women and women working in unpaid jobs, it's all around the world, it's not only in India, so most of now, everywhere women are working unpaid work. So, and I talked already about being high resilience, being uh, very influencing uh, to other, and how we can work for uh, <coughs> They have participation, they have lots of uh, networking, they have lots of opportunities that we can work in it. So, and women have lots of, and in socioeconomy, we always found that when we, how can we merit, uh, measure the, uh, capacity that we have. We do have a human capital, natural capital, social capital, physical capital, financial capital. So the way we count the capitals that women have, it's going to change even our measuring, the way we measure the GDP and how we are contributing to the development of our country. It's not only about thinking only about the financial capital that we are working in in such a way. So if we count everything then we can make things in uh, a different way. Uh, I will not talk about these examples to make my, uh, just I'm going to end up here. I hope my speech was not that long. And uh, here are some of the journals I was looking. We have an inspiration resilience Canada journal and young international journal that when we talk about youth, we don't talk about youth only as the age, but only as a spread. So, I hope I can, uh, you can all publish with us as I'm being here among all these distinguished people. So thanks a lot, and if there are any questions, I'm ready to answer. Thank you so much, ma'am. I request Professor Yel Sereswini to present the Momento Certificate and Honor to Dr. Dunya Ahmed. Thank you. 
Thank you. 